Hello, thank you for coming to my Acoustics Virtually Everywhere talk. My name is Robert White. I'm at Tufts University in Medford, Massachusetts. And I'll be talking to you today about some experiments we did to characterize some NEMS microphones for a cryogenic application. We're trying to use them for doing quench detection in superconducting magnets. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors. At Tufts, we have Zijia Zhao, Casey Owen, and Miskyle Analysts, who are our three students, and Professor Luisa Chiesa, who is the head of the superconductivity lab. And then at Tanner Research in California, we have Steve Chow, Amish Desai, and Michael Emerling. And then finally, at the MIT Plasma Science Fusion Center, we have Makoto Takayasu, who has been the uh, progenitor of this idea and has um, worked with us since then. The work was funded by the Department of Energy under an STTR phase one. So this is just initial experimental work to see about the feasibility of this technique. And we're happy to report we have a phase two funded and we'll be continuing to improve on these methods over the next couple of years. All right, so motivation for this project. In large magnets, superconducting magnets used in high energy physics in fusion and fusion energy research, um, there is a concern about a failure mode known as quenching. So in these magnets, if there is some local loss of superconductivity in the conductors, this will cause rapid heating, as you can imagine, and uh, loss of field uh, due to the rapid heating, but also potentially catastrophic damage to the conductors, which could cause uh, time consuming and expensive repairs. So there's a desire to be able to detect a quench event uh, either before or early on as it's occurring in order to shut down the magnet and uh, save, save this damage. So various quench detection methods already exist, including voltage taps, co-wound tapes, stray capacitance measurements, Hall effect sensors, strain sensors, and acoustic emission sensors, which look at acoustic emissions through the structure. However, there's a problem with uh, high temperature superconductors. So for high temperature superconductors, such as REBCO, the uh, normal zone propagation velocities are very low. So these uh, quenched regions, their, uh, their properties propagate very slowly down the cable, perhaps on the order of only one meter per second. This can make it very slow to detect a quench event that's occurring. And this is much slower than what happens in low temperature superconductors, such as niobium titanium or niobium 310. So for high temperature uh, superconductors, this makes, makes conventional methods slow to respond. Therefore, in this technique, we're, we're proposing something uh, kind of unique. We're proposing instead of using propagation through the structure or through the superconductor ca superconducting cable, we're going to look for acoustic pressure wave propagation in the coolant. Usually the coolants are liquid nitrogen or liquid helium. And in these, in these mediums, the acoustic propagation speed can be much faster, 100 to 1,000 meters per second. Hence, this will speed up the rate at which we can detect the quench. In addition, it may be easier to insert uh, acoustic sensors into the coolant space rather than attaching things onto the outside of the magnet or making voltage connections uh, to the, to the magnet, um, magnet conductors. All right, so that's the motivation for why we're trying to do this. So what we're proposing is to insert a linear array of acoustic sensors into the coolant space. So on the right, you see a cabling conduit conductor, which is a particular topology of superconducting cable. This is a cross section, and you can see all the small superconducting wires, uh, and then they're bundled inside a stainless steel sheath. And in the center, there's a coolant channel. And in that coolant channel, you'll have liquid nitrogen or liquid helium. And this is where we're proposing to put our array. So this is a long cable, uh, which extends um, for uh, some, some, some large number of meters. And what we'd like to do is to build a long linear array of acoustic sensors that we can insert into that coolant channel. And if there's a quench event, pressure waves will propagate in the coolant at a, rapid, a relatively rapid speed, and we'll be able to detect them quickly. And also we'll be able to localize where they are because we'll be able to see the relative time of arrival at different acoustic sensors down the array. And by spacing the acoustic sensors in the array appropriately, we should be able to get to um, uh, rel very relatively short uh, quench detection times and also good localization. So uh, the first challenge here is that we need acoustic sensors that can operate in four Kelvin liquid helium or 77 Kelvin liquid nitrogen. So that's where we focused our first uh, experimental um, investigations in the first in the first six months of this program. And that's what I'm going to describe for the rest of the talk. All right, 
So we had to pick a MEMS microphone to use. So we used the Vesper VM1000 Piers Electric MEMS microphone. You can see on the left. Uh, partly we chose this because we have um, a good relationship with Vesper MEMS and we're able to get some bare dye from them uh, as well as uh, picking their brains about the, uh, about the functioning of their microphone. So this is a picture of their microphone with the lid removed. It's actually an older version of the Vesper MEMS mic. This is the one we used. It has a square diaphragm cut into slits here, you can see, and this is the MEMS device at the top. This is the actual microphone. And then down here, you can see the preamplifier ASIC, which is co-packaged with the MEMS, MEMS device uh, inside uh, what's usually a lidded uh, acoustic cavity here for the, for the package. So our first set of tests centered around verifying whether or not this microphone and its integrated preamp can, uh, can operate in low temperatures. First thing we did was to test these in gaseous helium at low temperatures. So there's a cryo cooler in Professor Kies's lab, which is uh, essentially a, a large uh, 100 centimeter long um, tube. And it's cooled uh, using a um, Stirling cycle uh, by this attachment, by the attachment of this thermal strap here on the left. So this whole chamber gets cold inside. And then we build a probe, which gets inserted into the chamber. So our probe is a 19 millimeter by 19 millimeter internal size square fiberglass tube, which will act as a plane wave tube. At the top, we have an electrodynamic speaker, which is sealed to the top of the tube. At the bottom, the tube is open. And then we have a, three different MEMS microphones that are placed at different locations down the length of the tube. And there are acoustic ports drilled through the, through the tube so that the microphones are measuring the acoustic pressure inside the tube while the microphone itself is, is uh, attached on the outside. So there's a number of subsystems to this system. We have the power amplifier, which is external to the cryo cooler. It doesn't get cold. Then internal to the cryo cooler, we have the speaker near the top. Then we have the tube acoustics, which are occurring in the, in the low temperature helium. Um, this results in a pressure signal, which is sensed by the MEMS microphone and preamplifiers, which are positioned at various positions down the length of the probe. And then the outputs of these of the MEMS microphone and preamplifier goes to a second stage uh, amplifier that we also have inside the cryo cooler uh, close by to the MEMS microphone to boost the signal. And then that's um, sent out uh, to the outside for data acquisition. So everything inside the blue box is affected by the gas type, pressure, and temperature inside the tube, uh, both the speaker, the tube acoustics, and the microphones. And then the, pre the preamplifiers are only affected by temperature. The temperature in the tube is not uniform. So these are plots of the temperature as a function of position below the top of the tube. So at the top here, the, the, the cryo cooler stays quite warm near room temperature. Um, but then as you cool it down, the temperature starts to drop and you get a colder spot uh, some 300 millimeters below the below the top, and then it warms up slightly towards the bottom. So these are measured temperature profiles as the as the crowd cooler is cooling down. All right. So in order to figure out what the pressures are in the tube, we need to solve the 1D wave equation, but with a variable wave speed. Because the temperature is a function of position, wave speed is a function of position. This can be accomplished using the WKB solution, which presumes that the wave speed variation is slow compared to the wavelength of sound. And then we have this solution for the two uh, forward traveling and backward traveling plane waves, where now the wave number is a function of position. And so the exponent of the uh, complex exponentials includes the, the integral of the wave, the position dependent wave number. In addition, there's a envelope function here, u of x, which is required in order to maintain um, uh, intensity down the tube and have, have there be no loss of energy. This, this equation is solved using the appropriate termination impedances at the top end where the speaker is and at the bottom end where the tube is open. We need to know wave speed and density and viscosity as a function of position down the tube, and we extract these from our knowledge of the temperature. We also include, include acoustic absorption in our model, both the classical absorption in the gas and also the wide pipe absorption coefficient, which is appropriate for the frequencies where at the uh, viscous boundary layer thickness is small compared to the compared to the pipe width. For these uh, calculations, we also need to uh, consider viscosity and thermal conductivity to be a function of temperature, uh, since the temperature is varying down the length of the tube. After we run these models, we get these red dashed curves. So this is a frequency response calculation um, at a particular temperature and uh, at a particular location down the tube. And so we can calculate these at any position where the microphone is at any temperature that we're running at. What we do is we compare that modeled pressure uh, pressure frequency response in red to the measured frequency response we get back from the microphone in black. 
and you can see that these patterns are a very good match to each other, and they agree well in amplitude, particularly at the bottom of the uh, of the valleys in the in the frequency response. At the top, the sound pressure is actually so loud that the the electronics are are uh, are limiting. All right, so now we have at the troughs, we can compare the uh, the magnitude of the measured and modeled pressure, and from that ex extract again for how much the uh, the MEMS microphone's sensitivity has dropped compared to what it was at room temperature. We can plot that against frequency on the left and take an average of that, and then we can plot that average against temperature. So now finally we have the reduction in sensitivity of the MEMS microphone as a function of temperature as we cool down in blue and as we warm back up in red. And you can see that for these three microphones that were tested here, there's no dramatic loss in sensitivity. There's some variation over the course of the run, which could be due to limitations of the method or to true variation of the microphone sensitivity, but there's no sudden loss of sensitivity. The next thing we did was to try this in liquid nitrogen. We have a similar setup. We have a plane wave tube with a driver at the top. Now we're using a Wilcoxon driver with a rod to separate the driver from the uh, plate, which is plunged into the liquid nitrogen. And we use an impedance head to measure the acceleration of this, which we can use to turn into a velocity boundary condition for our plane wave tube model. Using this, we can compute the expected sound pressure level that should be measured by the microphones. That's the blue dashed line here and compare it to what we measure. So the blue dashed line here is what we should measure. And um, what we do measure in air is, uh, is the blue and red curves here. And you can see we're measuring approximately the, uh, the correct pressure magnitude across frequency here from 100 hertz to 10 kilohertz. However, when we plunge the system into liquid nitrogen and we do redo the calculation to reset the zero dB point to be what's appropriate for the solution in liquid nitrogen, we now see a substantial drop in sensitivity. So the microphone sensitivity is 60 to 100 dB below what it should be um, based on uh, manufacturer specifications. All right, so in conclusion, we've proposed an acoustic quench detection method using a linear array of MEMS microphones in the coolant space of a cable and conduit conductor for superconducting magnets. This has the potential advantages of easy installation and rapid detection and localization and can complement other quench detection techniques and may, may be particularly relevant for high temperature superconductors. As a first step towards this, we investigated the performance of the VM1000 microphone in cryogenic helium gas down to 60 Kelvin and liquid nitrogen down to 77 Kelvin. We developed some methods to, that could be used to characterize acoustic performance in these low temperature environments. What we found was that the microphones uh, could work indeed in, in helium gas at pressures slightly above atmospheric down to 60 Kelvin with no substantial loss of sensitivity. However, in liquid nitrogen, we saw a dramatic reduction in sensitivity, which we attribute to the heavy mass loading of the fluid in contact with the MEMS diaphragm and its influence on the acoustic package. So we don't think this is particularly a temperature effect. We think it's more due to the heavy fluid loading, which obviously will have dramatic impact on the acoustic and mechanical performance of the device. So thank you for your attention, and I hope to answer some questions during the live part of the session.